By the way, if you want to, you feel led, you want to sing on the praise team, be on the praise team, you have to play every instrument up here. That was the message this morning. Know the exact opposite of that. Um, if you can play an instrument, you want to serve on the praise team. If you can sing, if you can carry a tune, if you can only carry a tune in a bucket, we'll give you a bucket. If you want to serve on the praise team, you let Lauren know. Let her know quick. She's PCSing soon. Um, but let Laura know, I mentioned last week, Matt and Doug are taking that over, so if you want to serve in the praise team, let Matt or Doug or Lauren know, and we'd be glad to have you as part of that ministry. Well, there is a story, we're jumping right into the dad joke today, no prelim, no warm-up, no, no events beforehand, we're diving right in. There is a story of a family where all the kids, all the grandkids got together for dinner. And so you can imagine they're all seated around the table, and it's, it's loud, and it's noisy, and it's chaotic. And the grandfather was having a hard time keeping up. Everybody's talking over everybody else, and, and he kept asking for, for things to be repeated. He kept jumping in with comments that were completely off base with what they were talking about. Now, his family had been telling him for months, Dad, you need to get a hearing aid. And, and he just he kept dismissing that, no, no, I, I don't need a hearing aid. I'm absolutely fine. And so as this went on, as dinner went on, and dad kept asking for things to be repeated, his daughter, finally, she just got fed up. And she blurted out, probably more forcefully than necessary, she blurted out, Dad, will you please just get a hearing aid? And he gave her the craziest look, and he said, what in the world would I do with a hand grenade? (laughs) I told you it was a dad joke. You know, there's, there's there's times when we just don't know what's going on. And we don't know what's going on. We're not quite sure how to react. And just like that joke, you didn't know how funny it was. You didn't know you were supposed to laugh at the end of that. There's times that it happens, or we just, we just don't know. We, we don't know how to respond properly if we don't know what's going on. And that's really kind of Paul's point there in Romans chapter 10. That's where we are this morning as we're continuing our journey through the, the book of Romans. We're in Romans 10 this morning, so, so take out your Bible if you have one with you. I hope that you do. Uh, take out your, your device and pop up your Bible app on that. By the way, if you don't have a Bible, you need one. Uh, There is one under the chair in front of you. Feel free to use that. Feel free to take it if you need it. Turn with me to Romans chapter 10. And there's a simple truth uh, that Paul presents there. Verses 14 through 17 of Romans 10. Very familiar passage, but a simple truth that Paul presents there. And that is this. That people can only become disciples of Jesus if they hear about him. And they're only going to hear about him if somebody tells them. A very simple truth that, that Paul presents. And I want us to see three things about that this morning. First of all, that we have the responsibility to make disciples. Each and every one of us, as disciples of Christ, our task is to make other disciples. Every one of us has that responsibility. We have the resources to carry out the task. God didn't put us in a little rowboat and kick us off the shore and say, good luck, have at it. Uh, we not only have the responsibility, we have the resources And I also want to see that the response of those disciples is not in our hands. That is something for God to take care of, for him to carry out in their lives. So the first thing is we have the responsibility. Look there at verse 14 of Romans chapter 10. How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how will they believe in him in whom they have not heard? And how will they hear without a preacher? And by the way, that's the same task that Jesus gave. Paul's not presenting something brand new. He's not presenting some profound truth that the church has never heard before. That's the same task, the same requirement, the same mandate, if you will, that Jesus gave. Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 through 20. And we have often referred to that as the Great Commission. Some of the last words that Jesus spoke. And you know, when somebody, the last words that somebody's going to say, they're not not mincing words at that point. They're not wasting their time. This this is the last thing, some of the last things I'm going to tell you ever. I want to make sure this is important. This sticks. There's something that I want you to remember out of all the time that he had with his disciples. The thing he wanted them to remember was this. Go and make disciples of all nations. It's the same point that Paul's making. And the very last words that Jesus spoke recorded before he ascended up into heaven. Acts chapter 1 verse 8. That you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you will be my witnesses in all Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, and to the uttermost ends of the earth. It's the same message. It's a call to disciple making. And discipleship in our lives, it has two parts. Being disciples, and that results in making 
disciples. That's the call. That's the challenge. Both Paul is saying that. that listen, there's a very simple truth here. That people will not become disciples of Christ unless somebody tells, him, tells them about him. And it is for us to do that. To love Jesus more and lead more to love Jesus. That wraps up what our church is about. And that's a simple truth. That as we love Christ more, as we get closer to him, as we grow in our relationship with him, the, the natural result of that is we're going to lead more to love Jesus. You've been to a movie that you just absolutely loved. You know, it impacted you so. It touched you somewhere inside. And you told all your friends, man, as soon as you got out of the theater... Right? You were, you were posting it up on Facebook. I just saw this most amazing movie. You've got to go see this. In fact, there probably came a point in time when your friends, they, they rolled your eyes when they saw you come, and oh, she's going to talk about that movie again. It just, it impacted you. And listen, as we draw closer to Christ, the, sort of the natural outpouring of that is we want to make more disciples. What Jesus said there in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, that you will be my witnesses. That's both a command and a simple statement of truth. That as we, as we recognize what Christ has done, and we realize all the things that Paul has said before this, all the amazing things that Christ has done in our lives, justifying us, sanctifying us, helping us to grow, all of those things making us dead to sin and sin dead to us. That as we, as we recognize the reality, the impact of that, we will be his disciples. It drives us to be disciple makers. And the church in Rome would have instantly connected with that. They would have recognized that because that was their experience. That's how this church came to be. That's what happened to them, how they became followers of Christ. It's unlikely Paul founded this church. Many of the letters that Paul wrote, he wrote to churches that he founded. It's unlikely he founded the church in Rome. He said in chapter 1, verse 11, he said, How I long to see you. And then he said this over in chapter 15. He said, I've often been prevented from coming. I hope on my way to Spain, I'll be able to stop by. It's unlikely he had ever even been to Rome before this letter was written. He didn't found the church there. Now, why does that matter? Why do we care about something like that? Why would that be important for us today as 21st century followers of Christ? Because the people of Rome, the people that were there in the church, the audience that he was writing to, these followers of Christ, they became followers of Christ, not because of a pastor, not because of a church leader, not because of the great apostle Paul came to town and there was this huge buzz and they all came to a big tent meeting and they followed. That's not how they came, became followers of Christ. They became followers of Christ because regular in believers invested in them. We're told over, over in Acts chapter 2 on the, the day of Pentecost, that there in that crowd, huge crowd, they, they were there for the Passover. Many of them would have stayed for the Feast of Pentecost. And we're told in that crowd, this enormous crowd that were there, there were visitors from Rome. And no doubt they came to know Christ on that day. They returned to Rome. They brought the message. They were followers of Jesus because regular believers invested in them. And meant very likely that's the reason you're here this morning. That's the reason you're in church this morning. That's the reason maybe you're a follower of Christ. And whether you've trusted in Jesus or you're still searching or you're somewhere in between that, you know something about Jesus. You know anything about Jesus because someone took the time to tell you. Someone took the time to invest in you. And, and the command, the responsibility that, that Paul mentions here, echoing Jesus' words, it's our time to pay that forward. That's our task now. Someone did that in your life. Praise God they did. And now it's your time to be that in someone else's life. But here's the reality today. According to a Barna study, the Barna group is a, a group that, that does research on a lot of faith-related topics. The Barna group did a study. They released this just last month. And they said this, they, they interviewed Christians, I think 1,000 or 1,200 Christians, ages 20 to 34, so a lot in your age group. Some of us not, but a lot in, a lot in your age group. And they said this, that, that, neither, that, that, that nearly three-quarters of Christians in that age group, 73% of Christians in that age group, felt equipped to share their faith. Someone had taught them, someone had trained them how to share their faith, the Romans Road or some other method, and they felt equipped, almost 75% of them felt equipped 
to share their faith, but this is what else that study revealed. That 47% of, of them felt it was wrong to try to convince someone else to share their beliefs. Nearly half of believers in, in that age group, age 20 to 34, just felt it was plain wrong to share their faith with someone else. That's the reality of today. And these questions that Paul asks there in verse 14, they're rhetorical questions. They're not questions that are asked because he's looking for the answer. They're, they're questions that are asked to make a point. And here's the point. That, listen, if we really believe what the Bible says, and as we're sitting in church this morning, we've come to learn a little more about the Word of God, and if we really, truly believe what the Bible says, everything that he's taught up to this point, that man is inherently a sinner, that that sin separates us from God and the wages of sin is death, eternal separation if that sin is not forgiven. That the only way to have that sin forgiven, be reconciled unto God is through faith in Christ. If we really believe that those things are true, then, then we owe it to those we care about. We owe it to our friends. We owe it to our families, even if it makes them mad. Even if it steps on a toe or two, even if they're somehow offended by us sharing the truth, we owe it to them, if we care about them, to tell them the truth, to share with them. Jesus said, listen, if, if, if these remain quiet, he's talking about his disciples, if these remain quiet, I'll make the rocks cry out. And what a shame it would be if, if, if rocks had to cry out to share the message because the children of God wouldn't do it. Because we wouldn't. We don't want to be. We don't want to make anybody mad or uncomfortable. So I'm not going to try to make disciples. What a shame it would be an indictment on us as the children of God if the rocks had to cry out to praise God because we, cho we chose to stay silent. Because here's the reality. That if you and I won't do it, the church, the, the followers, the children of God, if you and I won't be disciple makers, then the question is, who else will? Who else is going to? It's us or nobody. There is no plan B here. If we won't do it, who else will? He lays out, we have this responsibility. This is the task that we have been given. Listen, if, we, if people, we're going to make disciples of Christ, they will not become disciples unless somebody tells them. The only way they're going to find out about Christ is if we take up the mantle and do it. I was at Il Faro International Baptist Church in Naples. I was there Friday and yesterday. And I was leading them through their first session of the refresh vision catching process. And I've mentioned a couple of times that our leadership team has gone through that process. We're, we're at the tail end of that. We're kind of wrapping that up and tying a little bow on the top and finishing that up. We're at the point now of, of crafting our strategic objectives for the year and, and making some very specific action goals for each of our ministries for the year to, to reach the vision that God's given us. And, and one of our objectives is for all of us to be more intentional disciple makers, for us to use this opportunity that God has given us, brought us to Italy, brought us, given us the ability to cross paths with other people that, he, that he's brought here to Aviano. And for us to use our time here very intentionally to be disciple makers. And here's my challenge for each of us. If this is easy in this service, look around, you'll see an empty chair. And it doesn't take a lot to see one in this service this morning. Look around, you'll see an empty chair. And here's, what I, here's my challenge to you. Let that chair represent someone that you, need, that you know that needs to know Christ or needs to know him better. So when you, when you come into the sanctuary every Sunday, you see that empty chair, pick it right now. And when you see it, pray for that person. Not only, not only pray for them, pray that God would use you as the disciple maker, as the one maybe to, to make them into a new disciple of Christ or to help them to come to know him better and grow in their discipleship. Use that empty chair as your reminder on a regular basis. Lift that person up. And God, would you open up an opportunity, give me an opportunity, give me what I need to share Christ with them, to help them become a more effective disciple. Most people have never done that before. I was talking to somebody a couple weeks ago, and, and she had led someone to Christ. First time she'd ever done that. She's in her mid to late 30s, and she said she, she was just this excitement, this glow. She said, I, I've never done that before. And I said, yeah, the reality is most people have. Most people haven't taken that time to share their faith, invest in someone else. Most adults have not. Maybe you've never done that before. 
But here's the second thing. God gives us the task, and Paul points that out. We have that responsibility of being disciple makers, but he gives us the resources. Verse 15. How will they preach unless they are sent? Just, it is, just as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news of good things. And his point here is not, very often I've heard this, this passage preached, and the message is this, that, that come on, we, we need to send out some more missionaries. But I don't think that's his point at all. And we read this in context. The context of Romans chapter 10, we read it in context of the entire book, and I don't think his point is, come on, we need to send some more people out there. I think his point is this, he's already sent them out there. God has already sent them missionaries, and them are us. He's already sent us. We consider ourselves ascending church. Everything about what we're thinking about is ascending church. God sent you here. He sent us here. He sent all of us to this place. He sent those people that you interact with at work. He sent them here. Some personnel guy at the Air Force Personnel Center is tapping at a keyboard, spit out your orders at the other end. But don't think that God's hand wasn't on that process. That was a very intentional move on his part to bring you here. He sent you here. He sent them here. He sent this church here. And during your time here, we want to put a couple of tools in your tool bag and then send you out. Send you out here into Albiano to, to, to make disciples in your workplace, to make disciples in the, in the BX or in the commissary, to make disciples when the Lord takes you out of here somewhere else to continue in that discipleship walk. We're ascending church. Does that process scare you a little bit? If you've never shared your faith, you've never been a disciple maker, you've never invested in someone else like that before, that might scare you a little bit. Maybe it makes you a little bit uncomfortable to think of a, that God's going to use me. I'm going to be the one helping someone learn the Word of God a little bit better. Maybe that makes you a little bit uncomfortable. Dare I say good? Good, it ought to. It ought to make us a little uncomfortable. It ought to stretch us beyond where we have been before. Bring us up to the edge of what we know we can do. And even beyond that, it ought to make us a little bit uncomfortable. In both of those task-giving passages that, that I mentioned, that Jesus gave, the Great Commission in Matthew 28, his last words spoken in Acts chapter 1, in both of those task-giving passages, he not only gives us the responsibility, but he gives us an incredible reminder. Matthew 28, verse 20, he said, And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. And then in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, he said, You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and then you will be my witnesses. He gives us this, this response, this incredible promise, the presence and the power of God, that when he calls us to this task and he sends us out, that we have the resources to do it. That's the point he's making in verse 15. They are sent. You and I are sent and we're sent with a, with a tool bag full of tools already. The power and the presence of God to be the people that he needs us to be. One of the big reasons, I think, that many believers don't engage others. They're not involved in discipleship. They're not investing in someone else. I, I think one of the big reasons, it's not that we don't care whether people go to heaven or not. It's not that we thought, well, I got my ticket. It's all good. I don't really worry about whether anyone else is going. It's not that people don't care whether anyone goes to heaven or not. It's not even that we don't recognize the task. If you've been in church in any, any length of time, you've heard the Great Commission preached probably a dozen times. It's not that we don't care. It's not that we don't recognize the task. It's quite simply we forget the tools that God's already given us. We forget the resources he's already promised us, his presence and his power as we go out and step out as disciples. We just forgot. One of the tools he's put in our tool bag, one of, one of the, the resources that he gives us is boldness. For when you think about the concept of being a disciple maker, Sharing your faith with someone at work, maybe, or, or investing in their lives and their growth in Christ. What you need is boldness, right? 
need the courage to do that. There's a scary moment. The butterflies start to kick up in your stomach when you realize I might have an opportunity to share the gospel right here. What we need in those moments is boldness. Acts chapter 4, Peter and John are arrested for preaching the name of Christ. And the, the authorities don't have anything on them. They put them in jail anyway. They don't have anything, anything on them, so they, so they release them. But they release them with a stern warning. You guys need to stop talking about this Jesus guy. So what do Peter and John do? And they go back to the other disciples and they tell them what happened. We got arrested, we got released. They wagged their finger at us and they said, you stop talking about this Jesus guy. And then there in, there in, in Acts chapter 4, they have this, this good old-fashioned prayer meeting. And this is what it says, verse 31 of Acts chapter 4. And when they had prayed, they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. And listen to this. They began to speak the word of God with boldness. You ever done something for God? And, and you think about it afterwards, <laughs> kind of debriefing yourself, right? And you think, where in the world did the courage come from to do that? That's completely outside of, of the norm for me. I have no idea where that came from, where those thoughts came from, where just the courage to open my mouth and speak. Has that ever happened to you? That afterwards you look back and you say, how in the world did that happen? That's exactly what he's talking about. And God, will, as he sends us, he gives us the resources. One of those resources is boldness, to speak and proclaim the word of God boldly. We, we, when we move out, we take that first step. That's what God's looking for us to do. Take that first step out of the boat. When we do that, he provides the boldness. He provides the courage. He fills in the gaps. The second resource he gives us, though, is the words to say. Well, you may have all the courage in the world, and you, you march boldly into your workplace, I'm going to share Christ today. And then somebody says something to you. Somebody asks you, well, you go to church, right? You know about this Jesus fellow. Tell me about him. And instantly your mind goes completely blank. You can have all the courage in the world, all the boldness in the world, but, but he's going to fill in even the words to say. Matthew chapter 10, Jesus is telling his disciples, he's sending them out, and he's telling him he's going to, to send them out, and they're going to heal people, and they're going to cast out demons. Now, i got to tell you, you think sharing your faith with someone's a little bit scary. <laughs> he's sending them out. He's, you're going to cast out demonic spirits while you're out there. This is going to be a scary ride for you guys. As he sends them out, he warns them. He said, listen, not everybody's going to be happy that you're out there. Some people aren't going to like the message. There's going to be some significant opposition to what you're doing. But he said this, even, even if that comes, even when that comes, even then, in those moments when there's significant opposition, his promise there in verse 19 of Matthew chapter 10, it will be given to you what to say. Don't worry about it. He sent you out. He's given you this task. He's going to give you the resources, and one of those resources is the words to say. And he said, this is the reason why, because it's not you who speak, but the Spirit of the Father who is within you power of the Holy Spirit. He has given us His very presence, His very power. The Spirit lives within us to tell us and remind us and give us those words to say. And it's not just the words. It's the Word He'll give to us. Those Bible chapters and verses that I trust that you're reading on a regular basis on your own. That time that you're, you're spending in the Word on your own, and I trust that you are. That, those words that you're planting in your mind, one of the jobs of the Holy Spirit is to remind you of those things. Now, he's not going to open up your head and by osmosis dump all those verses in. You can't put the, the Bible under your pillow and hope that tonight he'll magically make all the words go into your head. That's not the way it works. But as you spend time in the Word and you read through it, the, one of the jobs of the Holy Spirit is to bring those things to our remembrance, to help us to remember the Word that, that we've planted in our heart. Winnie the Pooh, little, little stuffed, silly old bear. Winnie the Pooh is always doubting himself. One time, Christopher Robin turns to him and he says this, Promise me you'll always remember. You're braver than you believe. You're stronger than you seem. And you're smarter than you think. 
And you've no doubt seen that meme, probably shared on Facebook in a, a number of encouraging ways. But let me, just, let me just twist it a little bit. Let me just add to it a little bit. Edit it just slightly. Improve it maybe just a little bit. The Holy Spirit will make you bolder than you believe. He will enable you to be smarter than you think, and he is stronger in you than you can even imagine. God has sent us out. He's given us the responsibility to be disciple makers. It's the call of each and every one of us, not just pastors, not just deacons, not just home group leaders, but every one of us to be disciple makers. We're going to be talking in the coming weeks more and more about opportunities for you to be involved in disciple making. But all of us are called. God has given us that responsibility. But he also gives us the resources. He doesn't send us out cold and make us figure it all out. But I think the last thing that we need to remember is that the response is not in our hands. As as God has sent us out, as he goes before us and he goes in us and he's working in our hearts and he's using us as tools in the tool bag, The response is not in our hands. How those people would respond to the message, how they will respond to the opportunity to be discipled, that's not anything that you and I can control. I think that's one of the other challenges. You think about disciple-making. You think about sharing Christ with someone. You think about about helping them dig into the Word and and get into it together. I think one of the other challenges is that thought that pops into our head and says, well, yeah, but what if they reject the message? What if I, what if I faithfully come and I share Christ and, and I step out and I realize that God gave me the boldness and he gives me the words to say and, I, and, he, and he brings to my mind some scriptures that I read before and I faithfully share Christ with them and they shoot the whole thing down. They turn around, they walk away and say, I think that's silly. I think that's ridiculous. I think that's a crutch I don't need in my life. And they turn and they walk away. I think that's one of the other challenges. One of the fears that is inside us to say, what if they reject the message? But look at what he says in verse 16. However, they did not all heed the good news. Now, this is the Apostle Paul who said that. The Apostle Paul who planted so many churches. Paul, who was instrumental in so many people coming to Christ. Paul, who today would have had a a PhD in Old Testament studies. He knew how to share the gospel. And Paul said, listen, sometimes I shared, and they did not all heed the good news. And I want you to notice something else. He said, they did not heed the good news. Whose responsibility was it to respond to the good news message? It wasn't his Paul didn't take those, uh, those times as a personal failure and say, I shared the good news, but, but they didn't respond. I failed in that moment. I failed to be a good witness. I failed to be faithful. He didn't say that. He said, I shared, and they did not respond. He didn't see that as a rejection of what he was doing or what God was doing through him. And we shouldn't either. Jesus said in Luke 10, Verse 16, he said, whoever listens to you, listens to me. Whoever rejects you, rejects me. Whoever rejects me, rejects him who sent me. And we realize even in the earthly ministry of Jesus, as he proclaimed the truth, not everyone responded. John chapter 6, it said some heard it and they said, that's a hard thing to, to understand. They turned and walked away. Not everyone responded to the message. He said, listen, if they reject you, don't take that personally. They're not rejecting you, they're rejecting me. If they're rejecting me, they're rejecting the one who sent me. We think about that fear and we say, listen, the response is, is not really in our hands. And I think the other thing for us to see here is it's not going to be our profound brilliance that helps other people know and love Jesus more. But look at verse 17. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. Now, I want you to notice he did not say faith comes by hearing and hearing comes by your profound brilliance in how you present the gospel story. You've got to have the best, most well laid out argument. That's how they're going to come to know Christ. He said, no, faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. It's the word of God, only the word of God that changes people's lives. As the Holy Spirit impacts their heart, helps them to see the truth, removes the spiritual blinders from their eyes, he does that through the word of God. Now, we need to be prepared. 
We need, to, we need to be diligent. We need to know the Word of God for ourselves. We need to, to know the Word of God so we can help others know it. But it's not by your profound brilliance, by, by the way you presented it. Well, now that you've explained the gospel that way, I'm all in. It's going to be the, word of, it's going to be the Spirit of God working through the Word of God. Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, he said, I didn't come with eloquence or wisdom as I proclaimed to you the testimony. For I decided to know nothing while I was with you except Christ and Him crucified. Now, Paul was a brilliant man, very well educated man. It's not that he forgot all that stuff. But he said, listen, my education is not the issue here. My brilliance is not the issue here. My skill is not the issue here. What's going to change people's hearts and change people's minds is getting them into the Word of God, sharing the Word of God with them. That's what's going to change their lives. And he said to Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 2, 2 Timothy 2, 2, easy to remember. He said, the things you've heard me say in the presence of many witnesses, entrust them to reliable people who will also be qualified to teach others. Pass that on, the Word of God. That's what's going to change hearts and lives. As I said, in the coming weeks, you'll be hearing more and more about how you can become engaged more in intentional discipleship, that we can all be the disciples that God has called us to be. He sent us out with that responsibility, with that task. He's given us all the tools that we need in the tool bag to carry it out, and then some. We have to go out and remember that, listen, the, the response is not in my hands. The response is not my responsibility. It's the job of each of us to faithfully share the truth of his word and leave the rest up to him. Let me wrap up with this. And most mornings I ride my bicycle from our house out to the south gate, and I hit that little traffic circle, and I come back. And it's not only great exercise, but i got to tell you, the, the view of these mountains over here just never, never gets old. I never get tired of seeing that. And out on the main street, you know, out here, there's several car dealerships. There's several mechanics shops out here on the main drag. And there's one mechanic shop out there. And, and this time of year especially, he's got this enormous German shepherd that hangs out in his parking lot. And, and every day when I ride by, that, that dog chases me along the fence and barks and growls and genuinely makes me glad that the gate is closed. Well, Thursday I was riding, the gate was not closed dog was out in the parking lot. And I rode by, and I didn't realize he was there until, of course, he started the routine, running down the parking lot, barking, growling, looking like he was hungry and I was breakfast. But something odd happened. He ran by that gate, and he didn't even acknowledge it. He didn't stop. He didn't, he didn't cut left and turn out of the gate and come after me. He just ran by it, didn't even acknowledge it was there. Now, you know, he has the task of protecting that lot. That's why he's out there. The owner's given him that responsibility. Big dog, you do that thing that you do. He had the ability to get to me. The gate was open. He had the resources. He had the ability to get to me. He certainly wasn't worried about my response if he came out. But he acted like none of those things were true. He ran right by that open gate. And as it is, I think, with many of us, our task is clear. We have the resources to carry it out. We needn't worry about the response or the results. But so often we limit ourselves. We act like the gate is still closed. It's an amazing thing to realize that, that you could be a part of something incredible that God is doing in somebody's life. He doesn't need to, to include you in that process, but it's something incredible to realize that you could be a part of that. And will you be one that he uses to help others come to know him, see the difference that he can make in their lives? Would you pray with me this morning? Lord, what an amazing opportunity. What an amazing privilege you give us to be disciple makers. Lord, you enabled us. Your spirit moved in our heart and opened our eyes. You drew us to yourself, helped us understand in our own lives our need to be disciples. You made us into disciples, and then you say, you know what? Go out and do that. And what's even better? I'm going with you. And I'm going to give you everything that you need. 
Father, maybe there is one here this morning who doesn't know you as Lord and Savior. They don't know that you're they're, they're your disciple. They never experienced that spiritual transformation. As Lord, as we enter this time of invitation, this, this response time, Lord, I just pray that you would just continue to, to open their spiritual eyes. Give them the boldness to respond. And Father, for your children here this morning, there's so often that we doubt and we're, we're afraid. We don't make disciples. We think it's somebody else's job. We've missed opportunities. Father, convict our hearts in these moments. We might come to you in repentance, experience your forgiveness, your restoration, cleansing of all unrighteousness, so that we can be effective disciple makers. Lord, would you continue to speak to us in these next few moments, we pray in Jesus' name.